Does your family like to play games? I grew up in a game family, and uh, we, we, we like to play a lot of games. I remember going camping as a kid, and we would play chicken foot a lot. Anybody play chicken foot? That's a good one. Uh, we play a lot of board games. Uh, I really like the game Sorry. I know that it's simple, but I really do love it. Uh, recently, I taught my seven-year-old how to play Battleship. I have a strange affinity for the game Battleship. I know it is a kid's game, but I really kind of love it secretly. Uh, I had to hide my disappointment uh, halfway through the first time we played when she uh, got bored and said she, we were done. Like, oh, but I really want to finish. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, playing games with my grandmother in the summer when I was a little kid. And uh, we played a lot of random games, uh, but <laughs> the simplest, most random game we ever played was a game called Racco. You ever played Racco? Uh, you just put the cards in order. I, like, that's all there is to it, but we played it for hours, and so um, we've, I've just always enjoyed this. Uh, now, me and my wife, we've played games for a long, for a long, long time, all the way back uh, when we first started dating. And uh, we've had friends tell us that uh, game nights can get a little intense, uh, because we're both super competitive. Anybody in here uh, feel that way? And uh, one of those games that has probably led to the most intense of moments, you're thinking it, is Monopoly, right? Anybody ever feel that? You identify with that? Yeah. Um, anyway, we, we're working through it, though. Uh, we would love to have game night. You know, it's all fun and uh, good. Uh, but in the game Monopoly, here's why I say that. In the game Monopoly, there's a card. There's kind of an iconic piece to it. Um, that is referenced outside of the game. Um, there's a special card. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you see where I'm going with this? There's a card called the Get Out of Jail Free card. Exactly. Now, in the game, if you have this card, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's not complicated. If you have the card, you can play it, and you just get out of jail for free. It's super simple. People talk about get out of jail free cards as kind of like a trump card for whatever situation you might be in. Sometimes people talk about it as if it was a literal card, wishing that they had a get out of jail free card. But no matter the premise, today in our passage of Scripture, we're going to see a get out of jail free card type of situation. Except I don't want to reduce it to just a card to be used or a trick to be played. Rather, what we're going to see is a story in the scriptures of God working in a jail to certainly set many people free. And so if you have your Bible, we're in Acts chapter 16. Go ahead and open that um, to that chapter. I encourage you to bring your Bible each week. I think that's super important. If you're new with us, let me tell you what we've been doing. Here at Trinity, we have committed ourselves to this year reading through the entire New Testament from start to finish in the year 2022. There's 27 books in it, and so we've cleverly called it 27 and 22. This is our emphasis. This is our effort this calendar year to immerse ourselves in the Word of God, to be working through it together for one purpose, so that our lives would be shaped by the Word. And so as we've been working through this, uh, we've found ourselves now in the book of Acts. And let me say this, if you haven't participated at all, it's a great time to start, truly. And if you started and, I mean, I get it, it's July. Maybe it's been a bit since you've been in the reading plan. Now's a perfect time to jump back in. We're, we we want to be a high commitment, low guilt type of place. Meaning we want to help you raise your commitment, but we're not trying to make anybody feel guilty because the purpose of this plan isn't to get a gold star at the end and say, I finished, I did it. Like, that's not the purpose. The purpose is that each and every day we want to let the Word of God mold us and shape us. And as we read it together, what it does is it has a collective shaping effect. And so that's why I say truly, now's a perfect time to jump in. Now's a perfect time to jump back in. And so we're in the book of Acts. We've, we've looked at several messages from it. And it's very important when we read all of Scripture, but particularly Acts, that we remember that context is key. If we're going to understand it, we have to honor the context. And so let's talk about the book of Acts just for a second. We'll, we'll, we'll go quickly. But Acts is the second book written by a man named Luke. He was a doctor. He named the first one after himself. No, it's called the Gospel of Luke and then Acts. This is the second book he's written. In the first one, he took great care to write in detail all about the birth, the life, the death, and the victorious resurrection of Jesus. And then in the second book, he picks back up the story 
And he talks about how the early church formed. And so early on, we see the promise of the Holy Spirit, the ascension of Jesus, and then once the Holy Spirit comes, we have a group of guys, a group of disciples, who are totally transformed. They were once a ragtag group of uneducated teenagers, and now they're church leaders, they're missionaries, they're pastors, and God is moving in mighty ways in this early church. With the formation of the church came rapid growth as the word spread, but with growth comes both challenges and opportunities, right? A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be in here, and we looked at Stephen, who's considered the first Christian martyr. And as terrible as that event was, what we also saw as part of the challenge of it is God worked through Stephen's death in order to scatter people. We, we use the word scatter, but it was really sending people so that the word of God would go forth. And so we're tracking the book of Acts. If you've been reading with it, you know that there's, there's lots of really great stories within it. In chapter 15, this is all important. In chapter 15, right before what we're looking at today, there's a big meeting. It's called the Council of Jerusalem. And here at this meeting, they brought in Paul and they brought in Barnabas and they heard testimony. And one of the, the major monumental things that came out of this was an emphasis and a, and a confirmation that yes, what we're preaching here, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is one, for all people, and two, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. And you see, as they were working through this, many of them were coming out of very religious backgrounds. They didn't know, are the Gentiles included here? Does everybody get to join the family? And then if they join the family, do they have to hold up all the old Jewish requirements and all that came with the law, and they said, no, listen, it's for all people, and the gospel is Jesus, period. Just Jesus. And so now they've gone forth, and the church is spreading once again, and we come to chapter 16, and we see God moving in mighty ways. And there's so much that we could talk about, truly so much within these chapters, but I've narrowed it down to just a few things that I want us to look at together, primarily three lives that were changed. And so let's look at the word of God together. These lives are recorded in chapter, or verses 12 through 36. But like I said, I want to just back up real quick and read one section because context is key. Here's what the word of God says, started in verse six. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the providence of Asia. That's a very interesting verse, don't you think? Verse 7, when they came to the border of Masia, they tried to enter, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So they passed by and went to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. I just want to say a few things. One, you notice the words us and we. This is, a, uh, this is because Luke was actually on this trip with the guys. And so just an interesting thing as you read the book of Acts, anytime it says we, it means Luke was there. Now this is a really incredible piece of scripture and an incredibly intriguing piece of scripture. And I bring it up just to say this. As you read through the book of Acts, what you're going to want to do is learn how to study deeply. And there are some really helpful tools that we can have in our toolbox to help us do this. And if you're taking notes today, you'll notice that there's no blanks. Sorry about that. But I do have some empty space because I hope you'll write down a few things. Here's two words that I would love for you to write down. Descriptive and prescriptive. These will be helpful to you, especially in the book of Acts as we read these stories. These two words, um, they mean different things. So descriptive, what we're talking about here is describing. So this is a story that is descriptive in nature, meaning it tells what happened at a particular place at a particular time. Now prescriptive is different. Prescriptive, think of prescription. The doctor tells you exactly what you're supposed to do, and we always follow the rules, right? But you're supposed to take this at this time of day with this food and without this food and all the things, take prescription. So when we read, there are things in the Bible that are prescribed to us. These are commands. Now, here's how we apply it. As we read this scripture, if we're thinking prescriptively, then we're, thinking, we're looking for patterns that need to be repeated exactly. 
But in my life, I've never had the spirit of Jesus actually prevent me from going anywhere. That's just not how I've interacted with the Lord. Rather, we, we see this as a descriptive story and we draw principles from it. And so we're not going to linger here, but here's the deal. When we look at this as a descriptive story, we think in principles like God can work through both closed doors and open doors. Just because you get a closed door doesn't mean that God is not moving, that he's not still actively working. And so if you want more on this, I would suggest you get a good book on hermeneutics. That is the art of interpretation. There's one by um, Douglas, uh, Fee, uh, Gordon, Stu- Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. If you're really serious about this, this is an excellent book that will help walk you through how to do this. Now let's jump in to the scripture. The first life that was changed. Starting in verse 12. Here's what the word of God says. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. So at this point, the, the group has entered Philippi. Now, if, when you're studying the book of Acts, this is a perfect time, if you brought your Bible, to flip to the back and see if there's maps in there. Um, I remember as a kid just loving looking at the maps during church. This is because you, you probably have a map called Paul's Missionary Journeys. This is an actual place with actual people. These things really happened. And it's important to remember that. Philippi also is the place where a church was birthed, and then Paul would later write a letter to them called the letter to the Philippians. It's like all of this is connected. Isn't that awesome? So, but here, the person we meet is a wealthy woman, and her name is Lydia. The scriptures tell us just a few things about, it, about her. In verse 14, we learn she's a worshiper of God. She's likely to be a Gentile like Cornelius. We, we read about him a few chapters ago who follows the Jewish religion, but he's not yet a full convert. Uh, The scriptures tell us that she sells purple clothing, meaning she's well off. She is wealthy because purple cloth was prized at this time. It was a very difficult process to make. It involved boiling sea snails in order to get them to release a chemical. It was very involved. I mean, there, now you know. Um, And so she had this purple company, and uh, and she was very uh, wealthy. Now, I don't know, Scripture doesn't tell us, I don't know if she knew about Paul. I mean, at this point, he's established as a a pretty key figure in the Christian community. This guy who was once the persecutor of the church, he's now converted. I I don't know if she's ever heard about him, but I kind of just picture the scene, because they're out at the river, right? They're praying, and it'd be like one of our Wednesday night prayer meetings, so we have groups that meet all across campus, and you know, a lot of times it's maybe six to eight people praying. It'd be like Billy Graham walking in and just having a seat and sitting there. And he's like, no, 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 y'all continue. But then ultimately he starts to teach because it's a giant of the faith. I, I just I picture the scene unfolding that way. And the scripture tells us that Paul shows up, he joins them, they begin talking, and they listen. And look at verse 14. This is an incredible truth. It says, the Lord opened her heart to respond. Because that is worth highlighting. That is worth dwelling on because this is an incredible truth that I've been praying for today. I've been praying for this moment. Right here, right where you sit in the central venue of Trinity Baptist Church, I've been praying that the Lord would move in such a way that your heart would be open to respond. This truth that we read in scripture reminds us that apart from God moving, 
All else is in vain. That's what we sang about earlier. Nothing of any lasting value is going to occur outside of God himself moving. My words, they might elicit a tear. They might make you laugh. They might put you to sleep. I don't know. But when God speaks, people's lives are changed. He has the ability to reach down into our hearts. This is the same thing that we see in the book of Luke Chapter 24, the two guys that are walking on the road to Emmaus, uh, verse 31 tells us that then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. It's this idea that God comes in and illuminates truth, that it's his power that saves us. Now, as we think about this, here's what it means for you and for me. When a person comes to faith, it is through the power of God moving, but it is our task to share the story. Paul, when he interacts with Lydia here, this is a brief but powerful example of what evangelism is all about. The task is ours, but the power is his. Another way to say it is like this. The Lord's job is saving, but your job is sharing. This is for all people. You see, evangelism is sharing the good news. This team that we're about to commission to go to Canada, their sole purpose is to take with them the life-giving good news of Jesus and go. Now, another definition of evangelism that I studied here recently, and I want to bring it to you and just lay it before your feet, let's talk about it, is this. Evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. There's a lot of really helpful definitions out there. I just came across this one and I really liked it. Last week I had the opportunity to share this in the North venue and I thought I would bring it here today too because it is, it is worth unpacking together as we think about just a couple of key words here. Sharing the good news. Well, first you gotta think about teaching. If you and for me, if we're going to practice effective evangelism, teaching has gotta be a part of it. Another way to say that more fundamentally is this. We've got to use words. There's this idea that's been floating around that if we just live a winsome life and just be a good example, that that's enough. And by all means, we are called to live winsome lives and be great examples, but for the purpose of teaching others. Well, what do we teach? We teach the truth about God, that he's holy, that he's the creator, that this is his world. We teach the truth about sin, that, that actually when I sin, it's a rebellion against God. We teach the truth about ourselves, that, that we are created, that we don't get to run the show, that, that we are in his world. We teach the truth about our identity, that our identity is something we receive from our creator, that we're made in his image so we have value, but the essence of who you are is not something that you get to decide or discover. It's received through the Lord. We teach the truth about how to be forgiven. Guys, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, there is a path of forgiveness that has been made possible through Jesus. We teach this. Now, don't let the word teaching scare you off. What, what I'm not saying is that it has to be some sort of formal, academic class, come in, have a seat, you know. Now, I like classes. And in fact, we've been working on our midweek classes that we're going to be offering here in this fall. And I hope you'll join us. Uh, one class that me and Pastor Rick are going to team teach is a tough sayings of Jesus class. Just write it down. Hope you come. But when I say teaching, I'm talking about this, this concept, this idea that you know something, you've experienced something, you have a conviction about something, tell another person. You do this all the time. Don't be intimidated by it. When you invite somebody over to your house and you say, let me tell you how to get there. Well, you gotta, you gotta go down this road and you gotta take a right and then another right and then another right and then a left and then a right and then a right. And a right. You've gotta explain it to them all for the purpose of it being helpful to them. Anytime you have a conviction about something and you're trying to, to share it with somebody, you're teaching. It'd be like me saying, listen, guys, I know you love tacos. Taco Mel, it's down the road. It's incredible. I ate there last night. Now, that one may be a little bit subjective, but I do think it's true that they have great tacos. And so if you're looking, anyway. Anytime that you're trying to be helpful to another person, explaining, you're teaching. So here's what I want you to do. When it comes to teaching don't overcomplicate it. We share, we teach, we reveal the truth, but also don't underestimate it because people's lives are transformed when they are taught the gospel, amen? This word gospel is good news that God through Jesus has done what we could have never done. 
He's made forgiveness of sins possible. He's offered us a chance to take on his perfect life, his righteousness, and to stand and be counted as a part of his family. The gospel is the good news that through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you and me can be forgiven. And so that's the essence of what we proclaim. Now, this last word I want to look at is the word persuade. This is an interesting word, and it's chosen carefully. The, the, the issue here is that I think this is what trips us up when we think about sharing our faith. We are attempting to persuade another person. You see, we understand because of Scripture that every person that you encounter is either walking in the light, meaning they have been uh, a part of Christ, or they are trapped in darkness. There's, there's no two other ways about it. And if a person is trapped in darkness, then they are on a path that leads to death and eternal punishment. And so we share the teaching of the gospel, the true good news, in an effort that they might be converted, so that there is a conversion that takes place. This does not mean that we reduce people to projects. That's not what we're talking about. This does not mean that we don't genuinely seek to love people no matter how they respond. But what it does mean is that we have as our goal a person encountering Jesus in such a way that their life has changed forever. I think this is vitally important. This word, it helps us when we think about persuade because we're not trying to manipulate. You see, if I can talk you into something, then surely somebody else can just talk you out of it. I love the way that Pastor Steve talks about his mission trips to Africa. He probably shared this last week, but I got to share it once more. He was telling me when he got back of exactly how he goes about witnessing to the African people. The Maasai people is where they specifically work with in Kenya. He says he goes out with the vet teams. And they, they go around uh, because they get to travel the most ground and see the most people. And so with a translator, they go to people and they tell them, we're here to be a blessing to you. We are here to treat your cows and to be helpful to you. But first, I have to tell you good news. And he says, through this translator, he says, you make sure that they understand this. If I tell you this news and you say, yes, I believe, we're going to treat your cows. And if you say, it's not for me, I don't believe, we're still going to treat your cows. They have to understand this. He's explicitly clear, and I love this idea that no matter how they respond, we're still going to be people who genuinely seek to love and to serve. But that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility that we have to see people come to faith in such a way that their lives are changed forever. So I hope this definition is helpful for you. I hope that it will benefit you as you think about what it means for us to live out the Great Commission. The Great Commission is found in Matthew 28, and it says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. This is what you do when you're in the family. My girls, uh, we started getting them to unload the dishes and uh, to do the dishes. It's a mess. We have to redo it every time. But they complain. And they say, why do I have to do the dishes? And I say, because you're in the family. And in the family, we all have jobs. Listen, if you're a part of the family of Christ, your job is sharing the good news is proclaiming the truth, is about seeing every person that you encounter as an opportunity to share with them about the hope that is found in Christ. And so if we jump back into the text, let's think about Lydia, our wealthy woman. She, her life is changed forever. She was trying to practice a faithful religion and she was very affluent. Now, affluence in the scripture is oftentimes seen as a stumbling block because affluence can be uh, something that blinds people to their need for salvation. But through Lydia, what we see is even though that is the case, the gospel is still for her and the gospel can reach past that and change lives because the gospel is for all people. Now, the next story that we're going to look like, this lady is completely opposite of Lydia. And yet, despite this, God moves in her life as well to set her free from bondage and captivity. Look at your, your Bible. Let's read 16 through 18. This is what the Word of God says. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. 
She kept us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Now, we're not given a ton of details about this young lady. We know that she's a slave girl. We know that she's a captive. We know that this poor girl is actually in double bondage because her slave owners treat her like property, and she's also abused by a demonic spirit, meaning she is in both spiritual and economic captivity. And the scriptures tell us that in the name of Jesus, that Paul delivers her from this demonic spirit, that it leaves her. In doing this, it showcases the power of Christ. Now, as Luke writes this, he doesn't explicitly give us details about her conversion, just her deliverance. But I believe that we are on strong ground, solid ground to count her as a convert because Luke's purpose as he wrote this is surely to showcase two things. One, the power of the gospel to deliver from captivity. And two, the scope of the gospel. When this young lady is delivered, it showcases that the gospel is is for all people. Say all people. Oh man, that was good. Think about these two people. We've got Lydia, the wealthy woman. The slave girl is poor. Lydia is a community member of high standing. The slave girl was exploited and abused. Lydia is religious and moral. The slave girl is broken and tormented. Lydia comes to faith Through a quiet Bible study, the slave girl, through a dramatic display of power, Lydia is presented with Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. The slave girl um, meets Jesus as the great and mighty deliverer. These two ladies were both brought to faith in Jesus, a reminder that the gospel can transform a person no matter their background. The power that brought the evil spirit out of the girl was the same power that opened the heart of Lydia, and it's the power of Jesus. Now, you may look at a story like this and you think, man, it's just not for me. You want to distance yourself from a a, a story about a demon-possessed girl. I don't see how that's relevant. Because I, I hope that you will draw hope from stories like this, because if surely If Jesus is able to deliver the girl from the possession of a demon, he is able to reach into your life and set you free from addiction and captivity and whatever bondage the enemy is whispering into your ear today. I believe that that same power is found in Jesus. Now let's look at the third life that has changed. Now we've got to read this in context, okay? So we're going to look at 19 through 36. This is what the Word of God says. Lean in as we read. When our owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Verse 27, it says, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, What must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And he immediately, him and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and was, he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, him and his whole house, household. 
When it was daylight, the magistrate sent officers to the jail with the orders, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. Guys, this is an incredible story, right? You probably studied it as a child in Sunday school, talking about Paul and Silas singing in the prison. There's a lot going on here. And this jailer comes to faith. His life is forever changed. And what began the scene was the arrest and imprisonment of Paul and Silas. And we'll see that this is really not a get out of jail free card. (laughs) That's really not what's being played here. Rather, we have a story of God working in their difficulty to accomplish his purposes. Meaning, their chains were loose but not to let the prisoners free, but to let the guard in. Because yes, they were chained, but the real prisoner was the one who was trapped in darkness, the one who was trapped in sin. And as a result of God moving, this jailer, he goes from being a prisoner to sin to being alive in Christ. Now look with me at verse 25. This is an incredible verse. It says what? That they were singing and that they were praying. Even though they were in the deepest, darkest hole of a miserable prison. They've been beaten. You remember that. Their backs are bloody and their their limbs are aching. And yet the joy of the Lord so filled their hearts that they were able to worship God. Look right here. Is that how you respond when life is tough? Is Is that your default reaction when things Don't go your way when you find yourself in the darkest, most difficult moments of life, singing and praying. For some of you, I know absolutely it is, because I've been there with you. As a pastor, I get the opportunity to sit front row to some of life's most difficult moments and watch people go through them, and each and every time, it's astounding to see when people lean into the Lord and the comfort they receive. I've been there with the mothers who are who are praising at funerals for children. I've been there as as fathers bowed their head and prayed with confidence when they heard the word cancer. Guys, for many of you, I know that you have put into practice exactly what's happening here. The, The darkest situation comes and your response is to lean into the Lord. Let me tell you, this is a gift to have faith, to trust the Lord. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, he said it like this. It's easy to sing when we can read the notes by daylight, but the skillful, skillful singer is he who can sing when there's not a ray of light to read by. Songs in the night come only from God. They are not in the power of men. Because I know this can be difficult. I know this can be tricky to try to put yourselves in this situation. Many of you don't have to imagine very hard because you've lived it. Maybe you're living it right now. You feel as if you're in a prison. You feel as if you're in the prison of maybe a bad marriage or a tough job or chronic health problems or maybe some sort of victim of injustice. Now listen, I'm not telling you that you should not try to remedy the situation. Uh, That's not what I'm saying. In fact, if you'll press on and read the verses that, that finish this chapter, you'll see that Paul and Silas actually protest what's happening. They say, hey guys, we're Roman citizens. All I'm saying is as you work to do that, don't lose sight of what you have in Christ. Don't lose sight of the fact that when you're in the prison, chained, and all of the trials are are raging, that God is still on his throne and can meet your needs. Why? Because there's something powerful about praising in the middle of a storm. The most passionate choir is not made up of people who are singing to the Lord, but of people who are clinging to the Lord. Maybe today was a tough time to lift your voice in praise because of the circumstances that you're in. Guys, it is good for our soul to give glory to God through praising Him. And the other reason is this. It's because people are watching. The Scriptures tell us that that they were listening. People are watching you as well. I'm telling you. You may think that nobody knows what you're going through. People are watching. And I am sorry for whatever you're going through. But no matter how difficult it is, I believe that God can still work through it 
if you will see your life as an opportunity to glorify him. When you do this, you're declaring to the world that it really doesn't matter what's happening on the inside, it can't affect what I've got on the inside. I think I said it wrong, outside, inside. But what you're doing is you're saying, even if the boat is sinking, God still has me. Guys, that is a powerful testimony. As we think about sharing our faith, guys, the most important thing that we need to do is just love Jesus at all times. And in the most difficult moments of life, be willing to stand and say, God, I don't have any answers, but I've got you, and that's enough. And I don't say that lightly, because I know that those moments are difficult. But as Paul and Silas sang, the people were listening, and God moved powerfully. In this story, we, we see something like an earthquake. The place shook, the chains fell, and the jailer, he thought all was lost. Oh, man, I'm not making it out of this one. He drew his sword. And Paul says, serves your right. No, he says, we're in here. Don't harm yourself. Come. And it was too much for the jailer. And so he comes in, this once hardened jailer. He says, guys, what do I got to do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas' response, look at verse 31. It's profound. And it's an elegant summary of the gospel. They tell him, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe. This word believe, it's not just acknowledge. The word used here is a word that means to rely fully upon, to trust throughout. It's to the full extent place your weight on. That's what the word believe means. He says, trust Jesus alone and you will be saved. He begins and he shares with the jailer the gospel. He presents the truth with him. And then the, the text goes on and it says that Paul and Silas speak the word of the Lord to the jailer. They're teaching him, as it says in verse 32. And if we learn one thing about missions, about evangelism, about the way that we are to live our lives, it's this, that the message never changes. Jesus, that's it. But the context and the opportunity and the time and the place and the details, those possibilities are endless. Because no matter what you go through, we take that message and we live it out. I truly believe that the risen Jesus changes everything. That's not just something we sing about on Sunday. It's what wakes us up on Monday. It is the thing that defines our life. And so today, if you are asking what must I do to be saved? The answer is trust completely in Jesus. Now the gospel has an immediate effect on the jailer here. He, it says that he cares for Paul and Silas's wombs, which would have been significant, and then he receives baptism. Guys, in the words of verse 17, which we've already read, I'm here today to tell you the way to be saved. It's by trusting fully in Jesus. In the finished work of of Jesus. It's like it said with Lydia, to respond with faith, to allow the Lord to open up our hearts so that we respond with faith and repentance. Two things that are required of us. Faith in what? Faith that Jesus is who he said he is. That when he died on the cross, that that actually paid the price for sin. That when we say he did something that you couldn't do, that he paid the price. When I, when I stand before God, and he says, well, why should you be allowed into this heaven? The only response I have is because Jesus paid the price for me. Not a thing that I have done, and that's the same for you. We throw ourselves fully on Jesus, and we repent. We repent. This is a changing. This is repenting of sin, repenting of the carnal way of thinking with which we live our lives repenting of the desire to be in charge of my life. You see, we've got to make Jesus king, which means I can't be a king. He won't be co-king. He won't share the throne. And so we repent of that and we place our faith in Jesus. This passage is crying out two things for us. I'm not trying to wow you with novelty. I'm just trying to tell you the truth, that the gospel is for all people, and the gospel has the power to transform lives. We've done something in our own heads. Listen, you need to fire your inner lawyer. Some of us have a whole firm working in there, right? 
Fire him. Because what we want to do is we say, that's true, but not for me. Couldn't be for me. He doesn't know where I've been. He doesn't know the way that I've wasted so much time. He doesn't know what I've done. Surely, yeah, God is good, but, but this gospel really isn't for me. Guys, think about the scripture we just read. Think about it. Three lives that were changed. Now, rabbinical sources tell us this, that when a Jewish man would wake up in the morning, he would pray to God and he would say, God, thank you that I'm not a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. And then in one chapter, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, comes along and says, through the conversion of a woman, a slave, and a Gentile, that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your background. The gospel is for all people, and the gospel has the power to transform lives. And so my question today is, what are you waiting for? Church, what are we waiting for? We must, because we are in the family, we must take this good news and share it with the world. This must be the thing that wakes us up in the morning. This must be our motivation and our driving force. We must be about this work. And listen, if you've come into the room today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you have not responded with faith and repentance, boy, I've got good news for you. Jesus died for you. And he loves you so much. The book of Romans says that, that he demonstrated his great love for us. Look right here. He demonstrated his love for us, yet while we were still sinners, meaning we didn't take a single move towards him, we didn't clean up anything, he already paid the price and now is standing today, right here, Trinity Baptist Church, Central Venue, right now, with an invitation for you to place your faith in him. And I'm telling you, if you do that, he will respond with saving you, with making you new, with giving you the hope and the truth that you need. And so guys, as the team gets into place, we're gonna end our service today by singing praise to God about what only he could have done, that he loved us so much that he came in and made a way of salvation. Now, as we sing, I'm inviting you to consider one thing, one thing. What is it that God is calling me to do? If you've been a part of this church for a long time, you've been in the faith for a long time, you've been walking with Jesus, then I believe God is probably calling you to take a deep breath and rest in him, but then also to point your, your head low and get ready to run after him. Because church, there's a lot of work to do. And we must be about the work of seeing people's lives change because the job of saving is Lord's but it's our responsibility to share. And if you're in the room today and you've never responded with faith, I would like to invite you that even as we sing, as soon as they open their mouth, that you come right down here to the front. Meet me here. I would love to pray with you and I would love to share more about what it means to place your faith in Jesus. If you wanna join this church, if you wanna take the next step of declaring your faith like we saw today through baptism, you come right now in this moment and you let us know but I'm gonna invite you to stand and I'm gonna pray for us and then we will respond asking the Lord, what is it that you want from me, God? Lord, thank you so much for your word, for loving us, for being here in this moment. As we sing your praises now, Lord, I pray that you will call us to take a step of faith. Fill us with boldness, fill us with courage and Father, help us to put into practice all the things that you are calling us to do today. And so, Father, we give this time to you now as an act of praise. In the name of Jesus, amen.